Hello, I'm Malika Shekhar, a haematologist in London, UK. Welcome to my podcast series called The Bitter Pill that looks at lessons that we doctors may learn from history. This podcast is called France. Let's start with this news item from The Lancet on 8th August 1992. The prosecutor has pointed out that the four doctors cannot be held responsible for the early cases of transfusion-associated AIDS. But they knew of the dangers and they had the power to do something to rectify the situation. So she recommended imprisonment. In October 92, Professor Jean-Pierre Alain was imprisoned for two years, reduced from four. He's now in his 80s and he lives with his family in Cambridge, UK. He's still active in research and I spoke to him in February 2021 about three turning points that he experienced in the 80s. Due to the COVID pandemic, we spoke via the telephone. Prof Alain comes from central France and in the early 80s he was working in Paris. There he headed an institution that looked after children and adolescents with haemophilia and researched blood transfusion science. Here are three audio extracts describing his experiences of those years. They are titled, A Good Soldier, the next is Bleeding, and the third is Scandal. The Good Soldier. Prof Alain and his colleagues are conducting a clinical study and their patients have been tested for HIV using the newly available test. They have two problems. The first is how to interpret the results. There was a meeting of the MIR study in December of 84. Right. During which we discussed two things. One is what is the significance of antibodies because at that time we had the preliminary results of testing 400 patients yes. and 30 percent of them being antibody positive yes. so we asked the virologist in the group what should we do with the data and they said we don't know what it means yet and the main view was duplicating what was known for hepatitis B, that if you had antibody like anti-HBS, yeah. uh, you were sort of protected. And at that time, that was the main view, which turned out to be to be totally wrong. Um, so that's, that's the first piece. So they are unable to interpret the results. The second problem is what to tell their patients. Does the second problem inevitably follow from the first? If you don't understand the significance of results, how does that affect what you tell your patients? Let's listen on. And then at the same meeting, we started discussing the information of patients. Mm. So my philosophy was to be uh, transparent and as informative as possible. Patients should be informed, even if we didn't know exactly the meaning. They should know what was going on and uh, what the initial results of of the study was, because I always considered that the more they knew, the better off they were. But then the majority of my colleagues in the group were reluctant to do information without knowing the meaning of, of the data we had. So we decided not to do the information. And I did it only six months later, in in June of uh, of 85. What changed the situation was attending a key conference. In uh, April of 85, there was the first AIDS meeting in Atlanta. And uh, during that meeting, I had a discussion with one of the best immunologists at the time and discussing what antibodies meant. And we raised the issue that it was possible to have the infectious virus co-circulating with antibodies. And that was really a very important piece of information 
because it explained the significance of the data we had collected. So now he and his colleagues understood the significance of the results, that the antibodies were not protective as they are with hepatitis B. And it took until the next meeting of the Haemophilia Society in June of 85, where all the treaters assembled, that there was another heated discussion about the same subject. And I finally succeeded in convincing them to, to do the information. So it was delayed by six months. <laughs> Maybe I was wrong, uh, but I thought it should be a, a collective decision. So although I disagreed, uh, I was a good soldier and kept to the decision because in, in, to a large extent I thought that if I was starting on my own information of my patients, they, they, they communicate a lot with each other. So that would spread out, that would make uh, the situation uh, uh, very difficult and uncontrollable. So I kept to the, uh, to the collective decision against my own uh, uh, position. That must have been a difficult situation it for was. you. Yeah. Very much, yeah. In this excerpt, The Good Soldier, Prof. Allen has talked about the dilemmas regarding information. Being transparent and conveying information in a timely manner are two important themes that come up again and again in the experience of haemophilia doctors of the 80s. Two difficulties troubled Prof. Allen. His peers were uncomfortable about conveying results that they didn't know how to interpret. In fact, he goes against his philosophy to be transparent about not knowing. There's also the added dimension that this is a research trial and responsibilities to patients are more strictly defined. His second problem is about the impact on the patient community if one individual clinician conveys such information and his peers do not. This was a heated issue at that time when the significance of HIV positive status was debated. The law has changed and peer agreement is no longer a robust defence. But patient communities network as strongly as medical fraternities. The code of conduct in clinical trials is more exacting compared to standard practice. So, faced with a similar situation now, we might be inclined to also be a good soldier. But the standards being different, we would march to a different tune. Ethically, we now have a duty of candour, which is the basic tenet of practice. But still, how we convey information that's evolving about which there's disagreement remains a heated issue even now. We've seen that with the COVID pandemic. Bleeding. We start with Professor Pierre Manucci, the renowned scholar of haemophilia and Prof. Alain's friend and contemporary from Milan. Prof. Manucci has been called to give witness in Prof. Alain's court case. He arrives in Paris. The court session is on the following day in an off-centre island. And he spends a night hiding in a modest hotel, worried about his friend who, he says, is being called a killer. He describes the day he went to the court, with booing coming from the court steps. Jean-Pierre Alain's story that I show you, Jean-Pierre Alain, a very good friend of mine, I was his witness uh, in the court in Paris, uh, and I can tell you that also, it was a very unpleasant experience, because they consider him a killer, when Jean-Pierre Alain was a person that uh, totally devoted to his patient. So he, got, he went really in prison for two full years, uh, where he learned... Uh, Chinese. And I remember because it was a very unpleasant situation because they knew that I was to witness for him. But the only thing I could witness is that the man had dedicated all his life to science and for patients with hemophilia. Well, first of all, I had to hide myself. I slept the night before in a modest hotel to hide myself. And when I went uh, to the court, uh, I did enter the court, there was a sort of a queue of the patient with hemophilia, they started to boo to me when I was going to, to go into the... On my opinion, you see, it's very easy to judge. And of course, with our knowledge, 
and knowing retrospectively what he view little by little at that time. So in any way, from our point of view, he, the only thing I could do, I was uh, very active in research and that's why I was uh, someone there. In if the press and the public reproach is daunting on the outside, the court proceedings were even more so. Let's see what Prof. Allen has to say about this episode of his life. Is there anything that you would also bring from your own personal experience? Because we have not touched upon the fact that you actually had to spend time in prison. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know whether you feel you could talk about that. Oh, yeah. I've, re I, I, I've written two, uh, one book about that for my grandchildren. <laughs> and, and my conclusion is that it was a very uh, productive uh, period of time uh, and my children say that I benefited considerably of that time. Well, but so I, I came out a better person. So, uh, but you know, when before I went to jail, I had an interview with a journalist and uh, he told me, you know, the kind of situation you have lived is going to be like stigmata. That, that most of the time, it's okay, but from time to time it's going to bleed. And that's exactly what happened. The wounds still fester and affect Prof. Alain's relationship with his native France. Mud always sticks. I learned how to live with it. It made a major difference in France. For instance, last year uh, I received an email inviting me uh, to talk at the uh, French uh, uh, National Transfusion Society. And two days later, I received a note saying, uh, a note that I couldn't, that this invited me because the current president of the uh, Transfusion Society uh, didn't want me to be anywhere in, in a position of visibility in France. So that's why I was saying about the bleeding. So that was a year ago. The impact of the events of 1980s are lasting. Some hemophilia physicians continued in their clinical jobs. Many pursued active research. Some moved laterally to other specialities. Many continued to publish and practice in these new areas. Few doctors went to prison, but many talk about their scars. Even now, when they talk about how they might have done things differently, Many of the doctors find themselves moved to tears. Scandal. The words crisis and scandal are used often in the description of these events. Prof. Allen has a view on the word scandal. I really think that, you know, a moment ago, you mentioned the, the word of scandal yeah. about what happened to the hemophiliac. There is no scandal. It's just the normal way things run when there is a, an issue where you don't know the answer to. And uh, so it was made a scandal for political and media reasons. But in itself, there is no scandal. And it's because people did the best they could at the time uh, with respect to what they knew and trying to put false on something that is inevitable and the natural way of things is, you know, that's the way things go and, and there is no way of doing it. The best thing to do is just to be as transparent as possible at the time. And beside that, there is no scandal. This disparity in how national performance is perceived by individual nations, the Italians I spoke to, so they never had the experience of public anger the way that some of the other countries have had. Yeah. But it reflects, it reflects national spirit in many ways, because the Italians have a fantastic talent for taking things easier than many other countries. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I think good food always helps. So, <laughs> <laughs> Prof. Allen's comments about the nature of these events refers to the fact that medicine and science are fallible and that error is intrinsic to it. Other words that serve to understand such events is the notion of misfortune. Legally speaking, many countries settled to a no-fault claim for the infections that arose from the transfusion in the 80s. 
lay and scientific literature even now sometimes allude to these events as scandals and crises. This is indicative of the perception that there was a failure to contain the problem in a timely fashion, i.e. during the time of evolving knowledge. So we've heard Prof. Alain speak about some crucial moments as a professional. He's raised many points. The dilemma of transparency when knowledge is lacking leads on to the question of trust, which, especially with his adolescent patients, was a difficult problem. His stigmata still continue and are disruptive. It's the nature of medicine that these events occur. We'd be better placed to accommodate to the idea of such crises and deal with them the best we can with transparency. The contract of being transparent should be able to guide us through the difficult terrain. But transparency raises its own questions. For example, when the US Environmental Agency published raw scientific data on toxic pollution in the interest of transparency, it resulted in better public understanding of the uncertainty of science, but it generated more lawsuits against the government's decisions on uncertain issues. The other aspect of transparency is that we should have the vocabulary to be able to explain and reassure that we can offer a way for the patient to move on to the next step. With these comments, I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast.